Last week, um, if you weren't here, you missed a really great service. <laughs> but you know, when I think about it, they're all good, amen? Amen. Because we get to meet God face to face in this place, and we are blessed. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you here this morning. I've been preaching a, a couple of series on uh, the prophet Elijah. Last week we talked about the encounter with Elijah on Mount Carmel, where Elijah called out fire. Now Elijah had invited 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets, priests of Ashdod, to meet him there. And when God consumed the sacrifice, the altar, the water, the ground, and everything standing around, the people said, Woo, God is the Lord. So Elijah begins, we are in the uh, 18th chapter of the book of 1 Kings. And uh, verse 40. 1 Kings 18.40. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let any of them get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. 850 idol-worshiping prophets are now seriously unemployed. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of the heavy rain. Remember, three years earlier, Elijah said, It's not going to rain until I command it. Amen? Amen? So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. He comes back, there is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. Selby, where are you at? Right here. Selby's my numbers guy. What does the number seven represent in the Bible? Completion. Completion. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. If it's my hand, it's a real small cloud. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariots and go down before the rain stops you. <laughs> that rained in three years. There is a cloud about the size of a man's hand coming up from the sea. And Elijah tells Ahab's servant to go and hitch up his chariots and head south. Now the reason for this is on Mount Carmel is a very muddy terrain. And once the rains really begin to come down, it's similar to when we have a three-day rain of driving on Bob and Martha's road. <laughs> it's a red, sticky mess. Amen? I mean, it's, you know, you slip and slide. So he says, you better get started. Now, notice this. Don't let this get by. Look at this real quick. Elijah says to Ahab, before he even goes up to pray, he says, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. It wasn't even cloudy when he said it. But he's calling that. He's calling that shot before the pitch is ever made. <clears throat> I was playing golf with a good friend uh, several years ago. And he was not a great golfer. He was what we call a hacker. He hacked his way around the course. And we were playing with my boss and JR, and another guy was playing with us. 
When we came up on the par three, it was about 150 yards, and he hit a beautiful shot. I mean, he's like eight feet from the pin. He stuck it. Well, sometimes your ego overloads your ability. <laughs> And he turned to me and said, take that. <laughs> nice shot, JR. Set the ball down, teed it up. Whoosh. I hit that thing about three feet from the pen. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and said, next three holes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a saying, it ain't bragging if you can do it. Yeah, yeah. Elijah said, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. And he prays. He's talking to God. We don't know what he's talking to God about, but I think he is saying to God, remember the deal we made? <laughs> Today's a good day. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The winds rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab <coughs> rode off to Jezreel. Now here's your first biotic man right here. It wasn't Lee Majors, it was Elijah. Listen to what it says. The power of the Lord came on Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. He outruns the chariots. That's, that's, and, and he's only going about, oh, 20 miles. Oh, just? Yeah, really. <laughs> he's moving. But here's, here's the phrase. Here's what you better catch. Because this is what happened when God unleashes things. It says the power of the Lord came on him. Yes. That word power in the Greek is dunamos. It's where we get the word dynamite from. He plugs in to Elijah the power of God. Now I believe that power is still accessible today. Amen. I believe we have not only an obligation, but I believe we have a responsibility and only into the glory of God to tap into that power. It's no good unless you're plugged in. Amen. I don't know how many times you've gone to start something up or, you know, maybe you've had this experience. I don't know, maybe it's just me. I was turned on the vacuum cleaner a couple of days ago, turned on the vacuum cleaner, and nothing. And I'm like, oh, great! <laughs> The vacuum cleaner's broke. Yay. And I look. <laughs> Martha, I'm going to respond like I was talking to JR. <laughs> I looked over. Sugar was standing there and had pulled the plug out. I cursed the vacuum cleaner, but it was the dog <laughs> that unplugged the power source. We've done that. Every one of us have done that. Go to turn something on and, I mean, pick up the flashlight and it's not working and you're thinking, oh, like, come back, and then you realize it's light. <laughs> and any batteries in it. And you feel really stupid. You know, like, oh, I knew that. <laughs> Elijah runs ahead. Of Ahab. Okay, chapter 19, this is where it gets good. For whatever reason, Ahab's wife was not at the pink notice that were handed out on Mount Carmel. But she did hear about it. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message, a messenger to Elijah to say, 
get this, and I quote, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. <laughs> Jezebel was a straight razor coat woman, you know what I'm saying? She is a straight, and if you don't know that, you don't live in the South. <laughs> Southerners know what a straight razor toting woman is, you know, and she carried it right here in her hose. <laughs> She's going to reach up under her dress. You better be moving some direction. She says, I'm going to kill him. Now notice that Ahab's been dealing with Elijah, but he never attempted to kill him. Jezebel declares, I'm going to kill him. And Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. That's a perplexing verse, isn't it? I mean, when you stop and think of things, it's a very perplexing verse. He had just called down fire. He had just killed all the prophets. He had called the shot on the rain. And now, he's running from Jezebel. I don't want to say that that is a lack of faith on Elijah's part as much as it is the seriousness of Jezebel. Whatever her reputation was, it struck into the heart of Elijah and he turned tails and runs. Let me say something. I'm going to stop here because I just feel like this is important. There's a lot of times that you can go to what we call, do you know what I mean when I say a mountaintop experience? Do, do most of you know what I mean by that? That's where things just can't get any better. Where you're woohoo, God, woohoo, God, woohoo, God. And the only problem is you don't live on top of the mountain. You have to come back down and live in the valley. And so we can have these great moments, these, these really monumental times for religious high. One of the hardest things about pastoring is to keep things of either keel. You want to keep moving this way. Because if you start doing this, your congregation becomes schizophrenic. <laughs> and most of y'all are close there already. <laughs> keep going this way. And keep going this way. But Elijah, so a lot of times you come off a huge, huge experience and depression will hit you when you fall down. I mean, when you, that's, that's quick, man. You come off of something huge like, I mean, Sunday, I was so exhausted Sunday night off the day we had. I, I, it just, you have to rekindle, rebuild. That. So Elijah's coming off a huge victory for the Lord. But then Jezebel strikes to the nerve. And let me say that you need to understand this. Satan is just like Jezebel. He wants to kill you. He doesn't want you made to make you ineffective. He wants to kill you. And so sometimes in our experience we say, wow, things were going so great. I was up here all the time and now I'm down here and Satan seems to be good. Yeah, he wants to. So he's going to do whatever he can in your world to kill you from being what God wants you to be. But sometimes he just has to make you afraid. Fear is the greatest paralyzer of the people of God. They're afraid. It's a shame. Let me think about this a minute. There is an arm of our government that can strike a fear in the American people just by sending you a yellow envelope. Everybody with me? And when it says, we would like you to contact us, Oh. 
Just fear. Just that fear. Just that fear. When I was in high school, when you get called to the office, it, they had a little pink slip. Ours were pink. And a student would come in with one of those pink slips in his hand, and the class would collectively go, <laughs> One day, a student came in, handed to the teacher, we're all, and, it said, and she says, Mr. Hayes, you're wanted in the office. The slip started walking to the office and tried to think of everything I did that was going to get me killed. <laughs> you with me? <laughs> How did you find out? <laughs> you know, that, that whole thing. I won't tell you what the rest of it was about. <laughs> I walked in. He, Mr. McBurr was passing by the principal. He said, come down here. Oh, this ain't good. He said, have a seat. Oh, that ain't good. <laughs> he said, uh, I, don't, I don't know how this happened. Can't figure it out. I need your help. <laughs> yes, sir. He said, somehow, you've been selected as student of the month. I don't understand. <laughs> Experiences when you come to the place thinking to yourself, I, I just soon die. How desperate, desperate place that is. I'm just making an observation here. I, I don't know. I, I, it just jumped out at me. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this, so I, I may not be really accurate. But notice that it says that he left his servant and went a day's journey into the wilderness. I will say to you, it's dangerous in the wilderness. And what I mean by the wilderness is that place where you get to where you rely on you more than you rely on God. When you take that mental journey, when you start saying to yourself things like, I just don't feel like going to church anymore. Here's the problem with that thinking is, first of all, you are the church, so you can't go without you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You are the church. Wherever you happen to be going, the church is with you. See, we think about church being, remember, we think about church being the building. I don't want to go over there. I don't want to be with those people. They're happy, and I'm not happy. They're joyous, and I just want to be depressed. I've earned it, and by golly gosh, I'm going to be depressed. This is what happens to Elijah. Elijah starts with fear, then goes to the wilderness, then thinks about dying. Do you see the progression here? The progression of depression, where it takes you. It starts with running. It also starts when we start thinking about ourselves more than we think about God. Let me go on. I've had enough, Lord. 
he said, take my life, I am not better than my ancestors. I, I have had that thought. I mean, not take my life, but I have had the thought, I've had enough. There have been episodes in my ministry where I've said, I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. Are you kidding me? That's one of my favorite expressions. <laughs> and sometimes I sit, I sit and think, man, I know why God called them sheep. <clears throat> then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. How many of you have experienced some kind of, and I don't mean bad, I need to take a pill, depression, but how many, how many of you have experienced times of depression in your life? Just almost every one of us, just about every one of us, right? Have you ever noticed something? Two things happen when I'm depressed. Now, some people, the one doesn't, but the other does. When I'm depressed, I want to eat. <laughs> Amen? Some people are going, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, there are some people who don't want to eat. The other thing is I want to sleep. I just want to be in a dark room, close my eyes, and I think psychologically we think, well, when I wake up, it'll be better. If I could just get enough rest. But when we're in a state of depression, when we're in a state of depression that leads to rebellion, when we start moving away from God, we don't get that Jesus fix that lifts us up. I don't, I don't know how many times... Different people in this church fellowship have said to me, they go off on vacation or they go away for a week or two weeks, and they come back and they go, oh, man, it feels so good to be back here. It feels good to be back in the house of the Lord, man. It feels, I miss y'all. We went to this church up there, and they don't have a clue. <laughs> I said, you're there. You should have gave me one. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He's late. He's asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. See, I told you, you get hungry. You get depression, you got to eat. You know, me, it's a chili dog. But, you know, for him it was. Get this. This is beautiful. Elijah is asleep in the wilderness, locked in the feeling sorry for himself. God calls an angel over. Psst, come here. I want to meet the food angel. You know what I'm saying? I don't have his name. I mean, I don't know if it's Chef Boyardee. I don't know what his name is. We don't like him. We don't gave him. But Chef Boyardee, we don't know. He calls him over and says, hey, did you go fix him something to eat? I got this. <laughs> and it says the angel touched him. <clears throat> now, I know y'all know I'm a little crazy. But I've been awakened in the middle of the night by a touch by me. I've heard the angel of God say, Barry, wake up. Because I've actually asked Sandy if she was calling me. Were you calling me? No. Go back to sleep. Okay. Barry, go back. Now, you may think I'm crazy, but I believe angels are in this room. I believe they're around us all the time. I believe we see them because the Bible says we entertain them and we don't even know it. So, Elijah gets touched. And notice that he's not shocked by it. Get up, eat. He's not disturbed by it. He's not shocked by it. And I think that's because he probably hung out with them a lot. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up, eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights 
until he reached toward the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to drive 40 days and 40 nights. You know what I'm saying? I don't. He has two helpings of cornbread and water. And the angels only instructs us for this. Eat, drink, you got to walk 40 days and 40 nights and go to the mount of God. Isn't it interesting that he leaves from Beersheba. He leaves and goes. Now, Mount Corb has another name. Does anybody know it? What? Sinai. The mountain of God. Forty days, forty nights, forty year wandering. Does anybody catch the numbers here? Jesus was in the wilderness. How long? Forty days. Forty days. I think we have a pattern. He says, "You go. You go." And I'll meet you there. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, it doesn't happen like that. Even though we live in a microwave, drive-through mentality world, sometimes it just doesn't happen like that. Sometimes we have to be strengthened for the journey that's ahead. Sometimes we must drink for the journey ahead, because the journey's hard, and the journey's long. He's going to walk through the desert. This is, I mean, if you look at the sign up, and that's what this is, nothing but rocks and sand. This is where they wander. He's going to walk the journey that they came out of Egypt after Sinai came to the Promised Land. He's going to trace back that journey. Now, I believe it happened for a couple of reasons. One, God wanted to say to him, you're going to meet me, it's going to cost you. I mean, God showed up on Mount Carmel, amen? So why doesn't he just send him back to Mount Carmel? Because the only thing that happened down on Mount Carmel was the fire fall. God wasn't in the fire. That came from heaven. But he says, I want you to come back to where you know I was. I want you to come back to the place where I am. And to come back to the place where the law was given, the institution of where everything was going to happen. I want you to meet me there. You see, our journey is what is significant because the destination has already been decided. Your destination, my destination has already been decided. We're going to heaven, amen? amen? We know that, amen? There's not any doubt about where I'm going to be. I die today, I die in the next 10 minutes. I just showed up in heaven. <clears throat> For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know where I'm going. <clears throat> so I don't have to fret about where I'm going. I don't even have to fret about the journey because God's got this. But it's the journey that is exciting. It is the journey that brings hope. It is the journey that we testify about. When people look at us, they should be able to say of us, wow, wow. And there should be those who are guessing, should say, I don't know what they got. But I won't be some of it. I don't know where you get that kind of faith, but I want to lay hold to it. Elijah is afraid, scared about his life. He doesn't fully grasp, even though he's done great things, he doesn't fully grasp for himself that God's got him. 
So there must have been some doubts in his mind. There must have been, you know, and he, and he does have this ego thing that says, oh, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that believes. God says, I'm to show you something, son. Something you can't even grasp. But I've got to prepare you for the journey. A lot of people in their heads have been asking this question. And I've heard you, and some of you have asked me this question. So I'm going to lay this out for you one time. If you ever ask me again, I'm going to slap you upside the head. <laughs> Increased in love. But I, people say, I don't understand why we hadn't grown. <clears throat> why don't we have large numbers? I mean, we got a great product here. I call it a product. That may be a wrong word. But. Do we or do we not have great worship here? Yeah. All right? All right, we do. We've got great teachers here, don't we? People who can teach the word, who can share the word. We have great fun here. I mean, nobody has more fun than we do. I mean, you can't have a hat day without having a great time. Amen? We have fun. So why are we busting out? I don't know if you ever thought about this, but I'm just going to interject something here. Maybe God's feeding us and giving us some water. Maybe he's growing us that we don't know about yet. Maybe there's a journey ahead of us that we haven't seen. That's why I'm claiming that this place is going to be filled in August. I believe God's going to begin to move and shake because he can. But along the way, he had to prepare us. How many of you were ready for where we are today when you first walked through the door to the casino? We weren't ready for that, were we? If he'd have come to us, we'd have gone, hey, hey, and run to the woods. <laughs> We would have found a tree to hide under. We would have said, I don't know. But over these last years, we have evolved into being what God wants us to do. We have come of age. I'm not worried. I've never been worried about the numbers. I am concerned about are we being all we can be? Are we believing and walking in the Spirit? Are we praying? Do we believe the miraculous hand of God? I know we say it on Mount Carmel, but do we believe it when Jezebel's coming after us? See, these are the things we have to lay hold to. And God has prepared us to be here today. He has brought forth to us the bread and the water for the journey. And something has happened while we weren't looking. Every Sunday, every Sunday, we're experiencing the mountain of God. Every Sunday, we're, he's here. Every Sunday, we feel his experience. On Wednesday night, when we're gathered together, when we're eating the meals, whatever we're doing, God is here among us. Amen? We don't have to run to a mountain. He's run to us. He's come to us. And he prepares his table before. And he's saying to us, oh, where's your faith going to take you now? Are you ready for the journey? Are we ready for what God's going to do next? Or are we living in fear of, oh, no? See, we have to do what we have to do. We have to do our part. Part of our part is engaging in him. See, Elijah forgot that. He forgot that God was running the show. He thought he was. He began to believe his own press. And Andrew said, hey, you got to go. you got to go on a journey. you got to go back to this mountain. He gets to the mountain and goes in a cave. He's not standing there looking at the mountain going, Ooh. Uh, this is the same mountain that if you put a foot on and you weren't Moses, you die. And the angel told me to come here. Well, there's a cave. I'll go sleep in the cave. So he hides away and goes back to sleep. We are the best kept secret in Fruitland Park. <laughs> we are the best kept secret in Lady Lake. We are the best kept 
secret in Leesburg. It's time we had a Mount Carmel experience. It's time we woke up. It's time we begin. Now, I'm going to stop right here this morning. I'm going to stop right here. Indicate. Because, before you move, hang on, don't move yet to me. Hold on, hold on, I got them right here. I got them right here. I got them right here. Next week, guess who's going to show up at the cave? God's going to show up at the cave. Elijah thinks it's all on him. Wait till God shows up. Don't read ahead. Don't read ahead. You want to tell them not to do something, Joe, tell them to do it. If you don't want them to do it, tell them. Tell them not to do it, they'll go do it. God's going to show up. And when God shows up, he shows out. And he's going to reveal something to him that is so miraculous, it's so small, it's the biggest thing we could ever get. God unleashed. <coughs> Praise God. This is what I'm looking for. This is what God has laid on my heart. God unleashed. Freedom unleashed. Freedom unleashed. The Holy Spirit moving and burning in such a way in us that we will step forward and capture the very thing He's called us to do. He has transformed you. Now He's going to set you on fire. And that fire is going to burn brighter than any fire we've seen before because God has brought it about. We are not just a group of people who got together, who didn't like anybody else and thought we'd be good hanging out together. No, no, this was not our plan. Freedom was not our thinking. Freedom was not our institution. God birthed freedom out of adversity. God birthed freedom out of loneliness. God birthed freedom in the hearts of you and people all over the world who came to a place of saying, I don't know. I just want to find God. I believe God's alive and well right here. I believe he's alive and well. And I believe Jesus Christ, his son, wants to turn us loose. That's my prayer. That's your prayer. This week, God, oh, Lord, burn a fire in me. Turn me loose. Let's keep it not a secret anymore. Freedom unleashed because God has set us free. And when the Son sets you free, we are free, we are free indeed. indeed. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, here's the warning. This is the time, this is the beginning where you say, hey, I, 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 I need that. I don't want to go another day without that. All you have to do is ask him in your heart. It's the easiest thing in the world. And if he is in you, and if you are lit on fire, this is when you begin to say, Lord, unleash me. Let me tell everybody. Let me tell everybody what they can have. We have become united in faith because we serve united in God. We serve the same God, the same Son, the same Spirit. It's time we can turn loose. Today's the day as we stand and sing.